Um, so we are in the Republic of Georgia, which you can see it does not border um, any of your southern states. It actually borders Russia, Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Our first term we sent, uh, we were in Azerbaijan serving the Azerbaijani people. This last four years, we have been in uh, the Republic of Georgia also working with Azerbaijani people. The people group crosses borders, even though we have political lines there. But we have been working with Azerbaijani people. Next slide. So these are some of the things that we've been doing over the last four years. Um, we've had home fellowship meetings and discipleship. Um, those are just some of the people that we've met with. Next slide. We've also had some personal discipleship meetings with some young people, um, encouraging them in their faith and helping them to grow. Next slide. Um, as a supporting group, you guys have helped us to invest into camps for youth and families. And it's been great to see things that the Lord has done in some of these family camps and youth camps. The, it looks a lot different than our camps, a lot more rustic, but the kids walk away having an opportunity to experience God, many of them for the very first time. Next slide. Um, we have uh, two things that are BGMC projects, all under our Adventure Club. I don't know if you're aware of this, if your church gives to BGMC any, but BGMC is Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, and we do have a project number, so if you want to specifically designate your BGMC funds to, these pro to this project, you can. Um, our Adventure Boys Club is a lot like Rural Rangers, uh, Boy Scouts. Um, we uh, teach the boys real uh, life skills, outdoor skills, along with a message about uh, the, from the Bible on building character and things like that. So these are some of our pictures from our Adventure Boys Club. And the next slide. We also have Adventure English Club, all, all in the same project with our Adventure Club. And we uh, taught kids English. Um, we were able to meet in uh, people's homes, uh, their yards and things, and uh, able to just build some great relationships with our neighborhood. Do you have a question? Uh, well, in the Republic of Georgia, they do speak Georgian. Um, ours, we were in a little unique situation because we were working with Azerbaijani people within the country, and they speak Azerbaijani. So, but they all want to learn English. So it's a great tool to use to be able to, um, to reach out to people just because they want to learn English. So um, next slide. Um, with um, partner support, we also were able to provide uh, some medical needs, some real needs that people had for surgeries. We were able to help provide the finances for those needs. And next slide. So as we go back to the Republic of Georgia, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Where we had in the past had home fellowship meetings, we are now going to be starting an actual English-speaking church in the Republic of Georgia. Um, this is designated as a project to give to, if you ever would want to, as the Shine Tbilisi Church Plant Project. Next slide. We've already started making connections in this before we left. We are, uh, have a home uh, waiting for us in Tbilisi, and this is the church that is, uh, we'll be working and partnering with. This is the Tbilisi Pentecostal Union, and there are church plant partners. That picture on the far right up at the top is the room that we're going to be meeting in. So you can pray for us and picture that room and ask God's presence to just fall on us as we're meeting. Um, the church below, this is the congregation, and Bishop Oleg is the man sitting next to the lady. He's got a blue jacket on. He is the, the bishop of the Pentecostal Union over Georgia. So that's kind of like the Assemblies of God um, in Georgia. And they have a congregation of about 1,500 people, which sounds like a lot, but you're talking about a whole country. So this is a very small minority compared to the millions of people. But we are thankful for them because they're providing a place for us to meet and they're our partners in this English-speaking church plant. Next slide. So our church plant will be both culturally diverse, generationally diverse, and economically diverse. You try saying generationally diverse a couple of times and your tongue's going to get twisted. <laughs> Every time I say that, my tongue's like, you don't want to say that. <laughs> so, but we want it to be a group of just all kinds of people because Georgia has a lot of different people that live there working or going to school and along with the Georgians who live there. And a lot of them either do speak English because they have to for their work or they want to speak English. So that is the big pull that we are an English speaking church. Next slide. 
The university outreaches will be something that's a huge part of what we do because the university students that attend school there are from places that a lot of us can't even go to. We have students from Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Iran sorry, uh, get, uh, they say Iran, we say Iran when we're in America, so. Uh, but also other places like Nigeria and India. All of these young people come and they study. A lot of them are medical students. And so when they go back to their countries after four to even up to eight years, if they're getting their full, you know, becoming a medical doctor, they're going back. Imagine the influence a doctor has in some of these third world countries or difficult places. So we want to disciple them and make them into disciple makers so when they go to their countries they are prepared to reach unreached peoples there. So it's a very big opportunity and of course we are still working with Azerbaijani. Some of our, our group that's helping us in this church plant are some of the missionary some of the uh, Azerbaijanis that we've been working with over the past four years, they'll be part of our church plant team helping us to get things started. And there are a lot of Azerbaijani young people who attend school and people who just live there that will be attending our, our church. Next slide. Um, so we called it the Shine Tbilisi Church Plant because we were inspired by many things, but this is just one of the statues uh, in Tbilisi of a lamplighter. And we want to be lamplighters, and we want to shine, share his incredible news everywhere um, to Tbilisi. Next slide. So we ask you, would you let your light shine among the unreached in the Caucasus? This is our scripture verse that we are uh, making our motto. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Isaiah 61. Okay, next slide. So these are some of the things that we are asking for. Um, for the Tbilisi church plant, our budget is about $2,000 a month. And these are the things that it covers. Our rent and utilities, support staff salaries, hospitality, so like before or after church, having some time of fellowship and food, that's very important in the culture. Uh, our website and promotional material and ministry equipment. So basically everything that you would need to have a church it, we need it there too, and so, but our budget is about $2,000 a month, and that's what we're really spending a lot of our time raising budget for when we're here stateside, is to get the church plant funded. So, next slide. Um, we have a huge heart for Compassion Ministries. Um, as a church plant, we want our church to be one that is continuously giving out. So, um, our leaders encouraged us to have just a separate thing, a separate project, would you say, so that people can give specifically for these compassion ministries. Um, but our church, as we grow, even from the beginning, we want to be giving out. As much as we are receiving, we want to be a church that gives out. The first part, we realize that, that giving out may have to come from American resources. But as we grow, we want the people that come to our church to realize there's a great need around us and we want to be giving out. So the next few slides, you can go to the next one. These are the things that this church plant, the Compassion for the Caucasus, will be partnering with. Just 15 minutes from our home is an IDP refugee settlement um, that's for internally displaced people is what IDP, IDP stands for. So just 15 minutes from our home is the village of uh, the Zaravani Church uh, plant construction. We're working and helping them. This is a village that uh, in 2008 people were displaced from their home when Russia began to invade uh, Georgia. And so people were given a small little plot uh, to live. So these people are not far from us and there is a group also associated with our church plant partner, the same church. They're building a church there and we are helping them. So they're needing about $20,000 to finish the construction of this church in this refugee settlement. The next slide. These are some of the very sweet people who live there. Lisa has her tithe, strawberries in her hand. So that gives you an idea. These people don't have cash, but she paid her, her tithe with her first fruits of strawberries she brought to church. So next slide. Uh, Georgia is a very poor country. And this is something that I want to encourage you guys, especially today. Any offering that you give, this is where our hearts are today. We really felt like the Lord would want it to go towards the poor in, um, in the Republic of Georgia. 
it's, you hear a lot in countries about the children who are poor, and there are definitely poor children, but the majority of the beggars and the very poor are the elderly in our country. There is no social or wel welfare program. So you see a lot of women who are elderly who don't have a husband anymore. They've maybe passed on. And uh, if they don't have children to take care of them, then they have no money. So a lot of the poor are elderly women, but we do see a lot of elderly men too, or just the poor. There's so many poor. But we want to, today's offering, whatever you guys give, we will be sending and uh, doing food distributions to the poor to help them with just their basic needs. Next slide. And ministry to the elderly, helping them with uh, bills and things like that. Next slide. So we are asking you guys to come join Team Tbilisi. Um, if you know of anyone or maybe someone in here has a heart for missions and you'd like to spend some time serving alongside of us, we're uh, asking for a couple of missionary associates. That's people wanting to spend one to two years um, overseas. Um, there's also the idea of maps or short-term workers, and that's just for a few weeks or up to maybe six months. And then we would love to have just some vision trips, people to come and see what it's like in the Caucasus region of the world. You don't know sometimes if you've never been, and sometimes if you don't see it, you can't have a heart for it. So pray about it. See if the Lord would lead you to, bring, uh, to come on a vision trip. And, of course, prayer partners. Prayer partners are... We can't do what we're doing without money, but we also definitely cannot doing, be doing it without prayer. Your prayer is what makes the soil fertile, and we need fertile soil where we're, where we're working. So these are our budget needs to finish helping us raise our monthly support, 10 new partners at 100 a month. All of that equals to about $1,000. We're a little less than that, but right at $1,000 is what we're needing in monthly support to get us back on the field. Thank you so much for your prayers. Please visit us at the table. We'd love to talk to you, answer any questions, just give you whatever information we can about where we serve. And um, thank you guys for everything. Amen. Um, so at the back table, we do have, we have Facebook and we have a private group. It's uh, first you need to send us a friend request on Facebook, Brett Donna Daly. So just our names and then send me a message and say, please add me to your private Facebook page. You're not going to find it by just searching for it because it's secret. But if you want it, please let me know. Fill out one of these cards in the back and it just gives me your information. We can mail you our newsletter or you or you can do it through email. Um, so that's what this is. Um, this brochure tells you all about our projects and it gives you the project number. So if the future, God lays it on your heart and you wanna give to one of those, you can do that. And then of course our prayer cards and we have some magnets back there too. So, all right. Thank you, sweetheart, did a great job. <clears throat> well, I usually have a little message that I've kind of been preaching some whenever I've been able to preach. And, um, but I'm going to kind of, if you guys will let me just be obedient to what God's put on my heart today. Um, some of this might just be food and fuel for your soul. Um, may not really always be, I think it's missions related, but that's not my target today. Um, you know, to motivate you to give, to motivate you to be a part of this. Because I already believe that you guys are a part of our, our ministry. I love your pastor and his wife. When just, I feel so comfortable around these people. And I enjoy their fellowship. And I've always enjoyed coming to this church. Um, because there's just a sense of freedom and um, peace here. Uh, that's what I experience in my soul when I come to this church. And um, so like Donna said, we, we really want you to know how much we truly 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 appreciate what you do giving to missions you're sacrificing uh, and I really really this is important for me I really really want to represent you well not only Jesus but every one of our partners this state uh, my home my home my, my parents uh, you know my family all of us, these things are important to us. Because we're not called to be saviors. I don't work for God. I do not work for God. I 
I do not work for God. I work with God. I don't work for God. I didn't sign up for a job, a full salary, all that. Listen, I do get that. But listen, I do not work for God. I work with God. He was the initiator. He was the one that grabbed a hold of me. When he saved me from the life of sin that I was in, he initiated, he delivered, he rescued me. From the very beginning of my life walking with him, it has always been about him. And you're going to see me from time to time, and please, I don't want you to be sorrowful. You may see tears come from my face, but it's not because I'm sad. It is not because I'm sorrowful. It is because my heart is filled with love and gratitude for the work and the grace of what Jesus is and who he is inside me. Because I don't work and live for God. I work and live with God. He's the one who took a hold of me. He's the one who reached down and brought me to him. That's why Jesus came. He said, I came to seek that which was lost. Jesus had great compassion and he wept over the people's lives and he, and he said, they have no shepherd. Basically, he was saying, they don't know me. They don't know me. If only they would connect, if only they would repent, if only they would come, if only they would just simply believe. Just believe in me. See, not believe, I, listen, I love doctrine, but I think sometimes we think, we, we get it, some, oh, help me Holy Spirit. Christianity is simple. It is not confusing. Christianity is about walking with Jesus every single day. I share all the time overseas, I, I shared this scripture in, in John. One of it says, in him was life. In him is life. And the life, the life, was the light of men. There's no more, there's, listen, we're not going to be given no more light, church. God has spoken and he ain't speaking again. You say, bro, what are you talking about? There's not going to be any more deep revelation because he said it all in his last words when he gave us Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, you ain't got to say nothing else, baby. His life, his purpose, the way he walked, the way he lived from the time he was born, from a, a virgin, this sinless, perfect man, man, was God. And everything he said, I do not speak the words they don't come from me. They come from God. They come from the Father. The things that I do, they do not come from me. They come from the Father. He always was saying that. And see, I see in that that Jesus established for us what it is to live as a human being. That we don't live for God. We don't work for God. We live and work with God. Folks, that's a, a radical difference. It's a radical difference because if you do it for him, it's like you're doing the work. You're trying to get God to be happier. You're trying to get God to smile. You're trying, listen, none of that, 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 that this, it, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work, church. No matter what I can do for God, and I'm not trying to make people, if, if some of you are young believers, say, well, it don't matter if I do anything for God. No, you're not hearing me. 
It matters that we have work. Faith without works is dead. And when we walk and work with God, listen, we will shine. We will have works. We will have good deeds. Because, but the motive and the impetus is all in here. Flowing from him through us. So he said, Brett, have you gotten to your introduction? No, I haven't. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. I don't know if they, they pulled that up or not, I, 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 but I'll read it to you. Now, this is about Abram, who later was Abraham. And this is a man that God initiated, took a hold of. And I want to say this morning that Life is all about, you were not created for time. When God created you, he created you for eternity. You were not made just for this life. You were made for eternity. You know, Jesus said, this is eternal life. This is eternal life, John 17, verse 3. That they may know you, the only true God, and the one that you have sent. So Jesus was saying this is eternal life. To know God and to know me. Knowing Jesus and knowing God. Church, listen, that, that, that is such a tremendous. John chapter 6 verse 29. The work of God is this. This is God's work. To believe in the one. That's Jesus. He has sent. Those are not hard things to do. When I say believe in, listen, I'm not just talking about, listen, you know the reason why I married my wife? Because I believe in her. I trust her. Who she is. I've, I got to know her and I was like, Man, I've known other girls and stuff, and, but, but man, this one, I, this one, this one. I am so at peace and I trust her. As I knew her. Now that, that's a human relationship, you know, and, and Donna can disappoint me. I can disappoint her, but listen, the point is, God, he does not disappoint us. And he wants us to believe not about him. Did you hear me? God does not want you to believe about him. God wants you to believe in him. Who he is. Who he is. His heart. His character. His words. He wants you to believe in him. Amen? That's what he was after with Abraham. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. You know, that's the first time in the Bible that the word do not be afraid is written or mentioned. First time. Never been revealed, never been spoken that we know of, but up until this moment, God spoke this to Abram and said, do not be afraid. Have no fear. And then, and then he says, why? I am your shield. Now, that means like uh, 
not just a shield of projection. That means like that word is, is like, I am, I like what one transversion, uh, one translation said, is that I am your sovereign. I am your sovereign. There's nothing in your life, there's nothing about anything in life that I do not have it covered. I'm your sovereign. I'm your shield. We would use this kind of in our terminology today for men. You say, I got this, baby. No matter what it is in your life, maybe some of you younger people, I got this. You need to hear God saying to you, no matter what you're facing the experience, you need to know in your heart and you grow in this. I got this. I'll, I'll give a short testimony. You know, I, I still got to grow. I want to grow in my knowing God. And this is all about knowing God. God is, his, his main objective is not just to, he wants you to know him. He doesn't want to just wash you, save you, clean you up, and then say, okay, make it to, wait, wait. He wants you to know him. Him. That's eternal life. To know him. We were made for eternity. God wants you to know him. And that's what he was telling us. He said, I am your shield, your sovereign, your exceeding great reward. Do not fear. Now, this was at a time in Abram's life. Listen, there was a lot of uncertainty. He had just faced some kings and God helped him with his little military group of men that God evidently must have trained them. They overcame them. God helped them. And in the midst, in the process of all of this, uh, I'm sure he might have had some fear about maybe retaliation or what, what the future would look like. He had been given promises by God. This man stepped out in faith and said, I want you to go and uh, I'll show you as you go. One step at a time. And he's got to trust. Listen, when somebody asks you to do something, I did. That. I remember my first trip. God called us overseas, and I said, "Where are we going, Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan? Where's that? I mean, listen, you're talking about a boy from out just right outside of Lafayette, Crowley, Louisiana. The furthest I've been is California and Florida. But to live overseas, I had ne to live. I'd been overseas, like Mexico, and but to live, uh, listen. But the Lord was calling. The Lord was sh was was going before us. The Lord was. I was if I was going to walk with Him, listen. I had to walk in that direction. I had to be obedient. And so as I did that, and I stepped out, listen. I knew God like this. But in that process, I, I, I knew more of God. And in everything in my life, I've known more of God. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me kind of give you, oh, what was that? I was giving a little testimony in that God's got this. I think it was 2020. Donna had some real issues financially to come back to America for her to have this stuff happen, uh, surgeries and stuff done in, in, in her life in Houston. Look here. And I do not believe in the credit card. I said, I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> and I gathered my little three children and my wife and I looked and I said, baby, I don't know how. There's just no possible way. Oh, but listen. I brought that to the father of his father. And I talk to him normal. I don't, you know, I'm not a thee thou, you know, blessed be. I, I'm, that's not me. And I said, Father, I, I just don't see how. I just don't know. And I was praying and fasting, seeking his heart. A couple of weeks later, I heard the Lord say to me, Brett, in here. I got this with such an assurance and I wrote a little thing to my wife and I left it and I, she woke up and that morning and there was that little note I said this is what the Lord says 
he has got this. And so I told my kids, I said, now we got a bag of little bitty of stones about this big. And we're going to write with a sharpie marker every time God has shown that he's got this. And we began writing on that little ticket, Gary Sapp, airline tickets. Another little stone, Chinese Baptist Church lets you stay there rent free for as long as you need. 10 to 15 minutes away from every medical need Donna had. Another stone. A buddy of mine named, uh, oh God, please help, I'm having a COVID moment. Eddie. Eddie lives in Houston, brand new, beautiful F-150 truck. Oh, man, I'd stop and guys would say, man, that's a beautiful truck. I said, brother, it's not mine. But let me tell you, he loved Jesus, and he's letting me borrow it. Let you borrow it for how long you had it? I said, oh, it's been about three months, two months now. What? Now, that's a friend. I, I mean, I'd have guys say, I would never let anybody borrow my car that long. Eddie called me and said, Brett, what you doing about a vehicle? I said, Eddie, I, I don't know, Bubba. My car's here. And I don't know. I got a rent one. I don't know. I got you. I got you covered. I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to tell you something from my own life. I, I, I never had seen my father do this like I've seen him in little ways. But this was such an impossible feeling to be. The weight of it all. And I love my wife. I wanted to see God. I, I, just, I just, I heard that I couldn't do nothing and I prayed and we prayed. But friend, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, friend, would you walk with God? Listen, did she go through things? You Answer me. Did she go through suffering? Yes. Yes. She went through suffering. And I wish she would never have had to go through suffering. But I can tell you this, in the fellowship of knowing God, in the midst of suffering. See, that's what, that's what Paul said. 30 years later, he says, I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. We want that, baby. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what I'm saying? God, yeah, the power of his resurrection. Glory to God. But then this man said, and I want to know him. In the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, church, I'm telling you, brother, you're going to suffer in this life. But you don't have to go through it alone. Which you with Jesus. Because he understands what you're going through. He understands when you're fearful. He understands when you're anxious. He understands when you, you look at life and you just don't know. You say, I don't know what to do. Good. Why stress over that? Why stress over that? We make it stressful. We make it worse. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. God, what are we going to do? Listen, that, that's Christians. And I've been there. We haven't matured enough. And that's not guilt and conviction. I, I'm being honest. Listen, that's where I need, I need, I, I need to know my, my, my daddy's heart. I need to know my father. I need to know my savior. I need to know him a little more because he's got this. Yeah. The Lord said to Abram in the midst of all of that. And listen, God had promised him things. And Abram is, man, he's sitting there and he's like, <laughs> Bude, man, Bude. Man. Ain't gave me no kid. Promised me all this stuff. Where's my child? Well, I'm going to have to give it all my inheritance and everything to that Egyptian. Over there. No, man, God, what have you given me, God? What have you given me? Where's my all the promises? Where's my heir? That's what he was doing. Read the chapter. 
And Abram, God says to Abram, Abram, I am your exceeding great reward. I'm your sovereign and I am your reward. Now listen, when God says he is your reward, he is. He is everything you need. He is more than enough than you need. And there's never anything we will not go through in our life where God is not enough. But for us to have rest, and this is what God wants. In his, he wants us to be restful. He wants us to be peaceful. He wants us to be joyful. Because we're trusting in him. That's what he was trying to say to Abram. And listen, and then when God did give Abram his son, Isaac, what did God ask of Abram about 13 years later? Tell me, what? Huh? Abram, you know me and you have been walking alone together in life. And you know, you saw a miracle there with old Isaac like I promised you. Now I'm asking something from you. Oh, what's that, Jehovah? I want you to let go of Isaac and uh, let me have him and give him to me. See, God is getting at what God wants from all of us. That God wants to be our life. He is the life. He wants to be our life. And when he speaks to us, listen, we, I, I imagine if God, we would withhold, we'd say, Lord, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could release that to you, man. That, that, that's a hard thing for me, Father. That, that, I mean, I, I, I've been through that, my children all leaving. I mean, the, boy, I'm telling you, when my first was left, brother, I, I was grieving. I'm not one of these kind of parents that want to see their kids go. We've had so much of a fun life. I mean, I, that, just my child releasing them, each one of them, I, I'll just say, ooh, keep them, Father. I said, I'm going to miss them. There's been times I prayed and I said, Father, boy, this is hard on old daddy's heart, man. Seeing my kids in another country in America while I'm over here during this COVID, Father. I got two of my babies overseas, Lord. They're going to be all, they're all right. And I'd have people call me, minister friends, hey, Brett, don't you worry about your kids, baby. If I got to drive all the way over there to take care of them, I'm going to get to them. People would call me, we got your kids. No, listen, and this shut down. Listen, you don't worry. We got them. And I would just look up and go, thank you. Because see, when people are walking with God, he's going to use and work through what? People. I, I got to get ready to wrap this up. Is this feeding you today? Is this encouraging you today and helping you today? I hope it is. But listen, this is missional. Because I, I, I live in a part of the world where, where people might know about God. I, I work among Muslims that they're so deceived they, they miss out on Jesus. Back to Abram. Abram knew the heart of God. And it didn't, first take, it didn't happen the first day he started walking with God. Years have passed. And he put him on the altar. And then the angel of the Lord stopped him. He said, now I know you will withhold nothing from me. That everything you have, all that, that you are, I now know, Abram. Even your greatest desire, your greatest, your greatest hope, expectation, I now know that in your heart and your life, you've given evidence and proof that I am your life. That I am your reward. 
Loving Jesus. You know, God said this, that he pledged himself, I am your reward. Baby, one of these in my bottles? Yes, one. This one? Yes. So when God says he's our reward and that he's pledged himself to you, and he has pledged himself to you, church. He died for your sin. He died for your sin. He pledged himself to you. And he also rose again. He rose again. So that you could be reconciled and justified and sanctified and become a child of God. He's pledged himself to you. What does he pledge? How about his omnipotence? All powerful. How about his omniscience? All knowing. How about his names, his attributes? That's everything that God's ever revealed. How about his omnipresence, his presence? I'm with you always. How about his immutability? I'm never going to change. This is who I am. Eternally merciful. His righteousness, his justice. I will fear no evil, for he is with me, said David. Scripture I've lived on overseas, and I would walk around doing this, Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Listen, there's many times, people might think I'm crazy, I'd go. Ain't nobody knew what I was talking about, but I did. That was a promise God gave me. I'd say, here, Father, you got to help me on this one. Help me through what? Well, let's see. Anybody following us through this past term? Let's see. Me and Don have been robbed twice. Sickness with my children, Alyssa, in the hospital late nine days. I had an allergic reaction to something. That I, almost, I mean, I was like, <coughs> couldn't even breathe. Uh my dear friends, Ryan and Laura and their little buddy, Caleb. Is anybody knowing all this stuff with us? Y'all been following us? Some, I see some of you shaking your head. On that Facebook, listen, you, you, you knew all this. Little family walking out of Georgia one day. and It was July 4th weekend. I just talked to him. <coughs> Ryan, just, we had just talked to him. Love Jesus, working with Azari. I mean, his wife, Laura, working with the Zary women uh, about abortion issues. Because that's a big thing, man, with them saying, don't keep the baby. Just encouraged working with them. Went on a, a July 4th weekend camping. They went by themselves. Got a little 18-year-old shepherd boy that took them to the, the little gorge. And on the way going, the young man, 18 years old, wanted to have sex with his wife. He got kind of rambunctious. The kid started crying. Ryan started getting a little uh, mouthy, you know, trying to protect his wife. <coughs> Young shepherd boy gets out his uh, little 22 rifle, shoots Ryan in the head. Baby doesn't quit crying. Shoots little baby Caleb in the head. Leaves the woman alive, chasing her. Gets her, rapes her, beats her, and the poor woman. To get with her family, jumps the gorge. These are people that love Jesus. You say, well, Brad, what are you, what is all this? And that's a, no, I'm trying to tell you what came out of that, though. The entire country of Georgia heard about this. Three million people. Three million people. Almost everyone I turned around when they found out, oh, Brad, you, oh, and I, oh, man, I'm so, I mean, I cannot tell you all the good things that God had done for that because Ryan's mama is a YWAM leader. Youth with a mission. Charismatic, non-denominational girl. Ryan, that's what he was. But listen, the point I'm trying to make in that is these people got a witness of forgiveness. This mother on Georgian television saying, yes, he should pay a penalty for his crime. But we forgive him. 
and preached the gospel to that country. What are you saying that for? Because I've told you, we are not called to be saviors. We are called to be witnesses. I get so stressed around American Christians. Because they got this weight on them like they, got, they, like they think they're going to win the world. That's not our place. That is not our place. Do you hear me? People say, Brad, well, how many got saved? I said, oh, we, we've only seen two people get saved. Two? I said, yeah, man, two. Yeah, man, two. I'm not called to, to see millions of people saved. I walk with God. I walk with God. And God just wants me to walk with him and be a witness. A witness to his love. A witness to his forgiveness. A witness to his peace. A witness to his joy. A witness, a witness. A witness of calm. Are you catching me here, understanding my heart? Abram walked with God, and God fulfilled his purpose in that man's life. But he only had, come on, give me the drum roll, come on. Living and walking, he only had, what? One son. But after you're gone, after our lives leave this earth, our prayers are still in the hands of God. Our life and our work, even when we're gone, is still in the, in the hands of God. And I think sometimes God might do his greatest work. Years, years after we have been a faithful witness. Are you understanding me? People ask me, well, God, what's God? I'm praying for an awakening in that part of the world. But I also know that God is a God of order. And the gospel started in the east. And 2,000 some years ago, that entire part of the world got a witness. And now we've come in the west. The sun starts in the east, ends in the west. And I truly believe it's all wrapping up. There's been a witness given to this world. Jesus, men and women like Ryan, you and your sending and giving. And I'm closing. I like what A.M. Glenn said. If Noah knew him as a refuge from the storm, if Abraham knew him as a friend, if Moses knew him as a redeemer, if Rahab knew him as a savior, if David knew him as a shepherd, if Elijah knew him as the Almighty, if Daniel knew him as a lion tamer, if Mary Magdalene knew him as a bondage breaker, if Martha knew him as a promise keeper, if Lazarus knew him as the resurrection and the life, if blind Bartimaeus knew him as the light of the world, if John knew him as the glorious king on the throne, surely you and I can know him too. You can know God. Maybe you've known him for years. But I hope your heart is still hungry for him. Some 30-something years after Paul had his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I consider everything compared 
to the surpassing greatness, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain and be found in him. I want to know Christ. I want to be like him. Thirty-some years, this man's heart's cry is still. The cry of eternal life. The cry of eternal life. I want to know him. And I want to know Jesus. Pray for us. Many of the people I meet in my life, I am literally the first Christian that they've ever met. Literally. The one thing that always opens doors for me and my wife, and she'll tell you this, people see something in us, our light, and what it is is Jesus. It's Jesus' fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Some of those Muslim women will ask Donna about us and our children, about us, our family. Because they see in us the love. And we're not, listen, we're not perfect. But the darker it is, the what? The brighter your light. And they'll ask her, and then she'll share with them about Jesus Christ. I'll have men tell me, uh, this one guy said, Brett, you're such a good man. I took my moment. I said, no, Hassan. I'm just a man. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is really, really good, my friend. And then it's that awkward silence, you know, they don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and I say, thank you for complimenting me, Hassan. But man, I'm telling you, Jesus, man, he's just so good. He walks with me, loves me, he loves you. That's how it happens. Pray with me because in, I truly believe that God has promised me When we go back and start this English-speaking church, which was by invitation of the Georgian bishop, this is not something I concocted. I preached at his church, and at the end of service, he said, Brother, I want to talk to you. So I sat in his office with a translator, and, and uh, he said, I'm not asking you to leave the Azari. Bring them with you. But he said, I've had a dream in my heart for 20-some years from within our church to have an English-speaking church. Will you pray about this? Will you think about it? And I said, well, man, I don't know. We've been working with the Azari. And he said, just pray about it. Bring them along with you. And I said, all right, Bishop. And I felt like the Lord was saying to me and Donna, I gave you a promise in Zechariah. Despise not the day of small things. Now, after 10 years, you knew no one. You have relationships, and now I'm, I'm bringing you to what I'm, I brought you here from, from the very beginning. To make disciples of all the nations. I had a pastor in Washington, Seattle, Washington, around that area. He came up to me and Don, and he said, I don't know you people, but I have a word from the Lord. He said, the Lord saying to me to tell you that your church will be a sending church. You will send people to other nations. And I said to myself, man, how in the world? That's what I believe God's going to do. And Isaiah 61, Arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And then it goes on and it says, for the nations will come to your life. Listen, that's talking about Jesus, but that also says to me that God's going to bring nations. The students, the young people, other people to what he's going to do, what he's initiating. 
Amen. So I close. I don't know. I hope I haven't been too long. But if I have, please be gracious. Please let the Lord's Spirit work through your life. Because you'll meet some ungracious people or maybe rude people over extending time or whatever. But I'm trying to tell you. You that are God's people. You are in good hands. No matter what the future holds for each one of us, you are in good hands. The level of peace, the level of joy, the level of rest, that will be your response to your trust in your Father. I want to pray with you now. Father, we come, and oh, we're so grateful to come. We've all been separated from you. We've all been away from you. But you gave us Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we thank you right now. Upon that right hand of the Father. For living and for dying and for coming to be our Savior. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the greatest privilege that we have. To draw near to you and to say to you, Father, we love you. Father, we, we worship you. Have your way with us. Have your way in us. Father, may your will be done. That's what we want, Father. We want your will to be done. In this place, in this day, Father, I'm asking that your will be done. Holy Spirit, for the purpose and the intentions of what you put this on my heart, and I have tried my very best in myself, Lord, to deliver this, but my trust is in you, that you have spoken to at least one today, but accomplish your will for this word today. Let it not return, as I know it will not, empty. That the words will not fall to the ground, but be held and cherished in the heart. Seed in the soil of a heart. And I pray for fruit from this message. I pray for yieldedness and blessing from this message in the lives of your people, in the lives of this pastor, in the lives of this ministry that you've planted here in Chalmet. Lord, may your will be done. It is such an honor to be with you, in you. And for the joy of that, we thank you. Increase the harvest of their righteousness, Father. Increase the blessedness of their work, of their hands, the fruit of their labor. For there is nothing that is done for you, Father. You know that is vain. Bless them, reward them. Touch lives and needs today in Jesus' name. Amen.